row, he keeps me singing. Once you get there, stand with me. We're going to sing the first, second, and last stanzas. First, second, and last stanzas of 250, he keeps me singing. Sing out nice and loud. You don't have to hear my gravelly voice. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life is wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Very good, very good, very good. Let's go ahead and open up a word of prayer. Dear Most Holy Father, thank you for Dave giving to us, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege we have to gather around your word. I ask you to please move me aside tonight, Lord. Help everything that happened here tonight be to give you the honor and give you the glory, and may you be glorified by all that's done. And whatever happens, we'll give you that praise and glory, and we ask it all in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you all who battled the snow and ice and cold and wet to get out here tonight. And for those of you who didn't and are sitting around watching at home, thank you for tuning in, I think. If you missed Sunday school this morning, we were having the uh, quintessential gremlins in the uh, system. We don't know what fixed it, which is okay because we were not entirely sure what broke it. But if you missed Sunday school, it's just because it wasn't meant to happen today. So... Uh, if you say, well, Tim, I missed it. I wanted to catch up what happened. Come next Sunday, I'll catch you up on the beginning before we start Sunday school. So, uh, But thank you for tuning in. It is greatly appreciated. Let's go ahead and get started tonight with prayer requests or praises. Does anyone have any prayer requests or praises for us tonight? Yes. Pray for Johnny and Passivant. A whole lot of stomach related injuries and illnesses, and he's not. Just, so just keep Johnny in your prayers if you'd be so kind. 
Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? I see a little hand. I can't tell who it's attached to from here. It's a yo-yo, okay. No need to apologize. I had a yo-yo in church, too. So I told Raiden whenever we were all kids, our yo-yos were square. They hadn't invented the round yet. So he's just fascinated by that. Um, if you'll continue to pray for my parents, my mom and dad, um, this week, it, the month has just been an adventure and fun and excitement. Uh, my dad is officially home for those who didn't hear on Tuesday. Um, he was sent home like last week from the COVID pneumonia scare. And they sent him home on a heart monitor because they kind of saw a whisper of something. Tuesday, his heart decided just to completely stop for about 11 seconds. And the doctors who were monitoring it weren't particularly thrilled about that. So they took him in and immediately uh, installed a, installed, surgery, implanted, whatever it's called, a pacemaker to kind of help him out. He's home. Both him and my mom are still recovering. It's a mixture at this point of just exhaustion, stress, and everything else. So keep my mom and dad in prayer. It is very, very much appreciated. Anybody else? Prayer requests, praises, anything or everything? Praise the Lord. We had a very nice week. We had a snowy Christmas for the first time in a very long time. Um, it worked out perfectly from a work standpoint because it started the snow just as everyone went home. And it was done by the time everyone went back. So I'm very okay with that snow. No, they do not. Trust me, I live there. I, I, buy, I buy that. I very much buy that. It's now, what, three days past snow and our road is still not plowed. Not our road. Our road's still not plowed. And our road has the fire department on it. So if anyone plans on catching anything on fire in Koppel, now's the time to do it and get away with it. So um, just not my house. We're next door. But praise the Lord, we had a good week. Everyone had fun. Whatever type of Christmas you were able to have, be it in person, be it digitally, whatever, it was a good, it was a good week. And praise the Lord for safety on the roads. Any other prayer requests or praises for the week? Prayer requests or praises. Michelle, doctor's appointment on Thursday. They're holding you hostage for a doctor's appointment. So we will pray for your doctor's appointment on Thursday. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests or praises? If not, let's go ahead and take these to the Lord. Dear Most Holy Father, Lord, we thank you for this day you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege we have to gather around your word once again. Lord, thank you for those who are here today. While it may not be great numbers or great crowd, we know that that is not the earmarks of you working. We know that crowds don't dictate whether or not you show up or whether or not you speak to hearts. So we thank you for that in advance and for whatever you're going to do here tonight. Lord, we lift up all the many, many prayer requests. We think of those who aren't here tonight, whether they be traveling for the holidays, think of Joe and Sky up in New York, whether they're away because of illness or sicknesses, Lord, or injuries, or whatever the circumstances, put your healing hand upon them, draw them close, Lord. Let them know that we are praying for them, we do care about them, and just put your healing hand upon them. We think of this uh, guy named Johnny, Lord, just continue to bless there, help the doctors, give them wisdom, help them to know the best course of action and what needs to be done when, and Lord, just continue to guide and direct there. Lord, we think of my parents, continue to just bless and heal them, continue to help them as they're on the road to recovery for the symptoms to disappear, Lord, and all the little side effects and odd tweaks that are happening to just kind of fade away. And Lord, just help to be smooth sailing for a few weeks. Help them with the stress level, Lord, and just be a blessing to them and put your hand upon them. Lord, think of Michelle with her uh, doctor's appointment this Thursday. Help it to go good, Lord, and just thank you for this week. Thank you for the good times we've had, the fellowship we had with family and friends, and safety on the road during snowstorms, and just your constant blessing each and every day. And whatever happens, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Make sure to take these home and keep them in prayer throughout the week. If you're watching online and you have a prayer request you would like to send in, if you're comfortable everybody knowing it, you're more than welcome to put it in the chat. And Rachel's back there monitoring the chat as we speak, and she'll be more than happy to kind of take care of it for you. If not, 
you can take it into Pastor, you can take it into Pastor who's currently crawling underneath the camera. Uh, you can text it into him, text it into Rachel, text it into me, and we'll make sure we get on the prayer list for you. Um, announcements, so we're still on for New Year's Eve at the moment, sort of, kind of, correct? Six o'clock. As of right now, six o'clock here at, on New Year's Eve, we will be having a watch night service, food followed by preaching and prayer and singing and praising, and just generally, let's get rid of 2020 in the best possible means possible. So everyone bring a can of vegetables. That sound like, sounds like a recipe for hobo stew, if I've ever heard one. So if you're not familiar with the concept of hobo stew, everyone brings a can of vegetables. Uh, we provide kind of like the stew meat and the base of it, and we just dump it all in a pot and see what comes out. And then we'll sit around and we'll praise the Lord, we'll sing, we'll preach, and do whatever we can to get 2020 out in the best possible fashion, because let's face it, whatever we did last year didn't quite work out well, so we're going to double our efforts this year. So um, no Wednesday evening service. This week there will be no Wednesday evening service, since we will be meeting up on, that's Thursday night, right? My weeks are kind of a mush. So since we're meeting up on Thursday night, there will be no Wednesday evening service. So Thursday night, 6 o'clock, bring a can of uh, veggies. If you are a guy and you're interested in saying something, preaching, praising the Lord, whatever it may be, if you have a special song you would like to sing, get in contact with Pastor and he'll get you on the docket. Um, any special singing means I don't have to special sing. So anybody and everybody, please feel free to chime in on that. It would be appreciated. But as I said, 2020 has been bad enough. The last voice you want to hear ringing it out is me singing. So, although that would be very fitting. So, uh, that's coming up on Thursday evening, 6 o'clock. Aside from that, next Sunday, all of our normal services at their normal time. And then we'll join in kind of back to life as normal as far as the service perspective goes. At this time, grab your psalm books again, if you will. Turn with me to 231. Follow on, 231, follow on. Once you have turned there, if you'll stand with me, we will sing all three stanzas. That's all three stanzas of 231, follow on. You know the going rule when I lead singing, if I can't hear you singing next, we sing a kiddo song and you have to stand up, sit down, and all that good stuff. I'll do Do Lord where we sign this. Uh, course we just watch Kimberly cringe at how bad our signing is so follow on all three stanzas nice and loud <clears throat> down in the valley with my savior I would go where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow everywhere he leads me I would follow follow on walking in his footsteps till the crown be won Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. Where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Danger cannot fright me while my Lord is near. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep, close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod. Up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. 
Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Very good, very good, very good. You may be seated. Thank you, Miss Kimberly. Grab your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. I don't have a ton for us tonight. Everyone is probably coming off of their cookie high. I'm upset the quiet seat of today was a giant, like five, it was supposed to be a five pound Hershey kiss that we later found that was in fact hollow. And now we are writing very angry letters to Willie Hershey or whatever his name is, complaining that we got a hollow Hershey kiss. So. Daniel chapter 4, once you get there, we'll start reading in verse number 1. Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought towards me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Most Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for saving us. to us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege we have to gather around your word, Lord. I ask you to please move me aside. Help nothing I say or do get in the way of your sermon, Lord. Help nothing about me to interfere with what your words would be. Bless me, Lord. Help tonight. Help whatever is said be for your honor, for your glory, and to accomplish your will. And we ask it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. A couple weeks ago, it's been a few weeks now because we had Christmas in between there, and I think the Sunday before that I missed out because of my parents. So it's been a while. But last time we were together on a Sunday evening, we started into Daniel chapter 4, which is one of the most fascinatingly unique chapters in the entire Bible. Because Daniel chapter 4 is written by a heathen, at, the, at least at the start of the chapter, completely godless foreign king who is oppressing Israel, Nebuchadnezzar. We have been studying Daniel for this will make sermon number 11 in Daniel, and for the first three chapters, Nebuchadnezzar has not done a single redeeming thing in his life. Everything he's done has been done out of pride and arrogancy, even whenever he'll come to a point, because multiple times in the last three chapters, he has come to a point where he upholds Daniel and praises Daniel's God and acknowledges Daniel's God as a high and powerful God, it quickly fades away. It doesn't stick. It's good pomp and circumstance at the time because a need has been met, but then the next chapter he's erecting a golden statue to himself so his reign would last forever. And he is chosen to write a chapter of the Bible. God breathes through him to write a chapter. Last time we were together, we discussed those first three verses. We discussed the absolute anomaly of his greeting. We talked about how it's so very unlike Nebuchadnezzar that it cannot help but scream that a change has happened in this man's life. What follows is his story. It's what takes him from being a godless king to what I truly and honestly believe is a saved man. And we're going to focus here on the next couple verses. We're going to get down to when the dream begins. And we're just going to kind of read through the passage and we're going to let the Bible speak for itself. There is not an overarching theme to this sermon, which is very, um, it's not how I like to do things. I like there to be a simple theme. God wants you to do blank here, let me show you from the Bible what God wants you to do and how he wants to. Instead, we're going to just let the Bible speak for itself. We're going to see a lot of what this evil, wicked king thinks he does, mindsets he has, and in response, what we as Christians are supposed to do for it. But we see there, first of all, in verse number four, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. This is an important verse. It doesn't just set the scene for us, which it does. It sets the scene of Nebuchadnezzar all snug and tidied into his little bed, at rest and quote-unquote flourishing. 
meaning he was having a very successful time. And if you look at it from just a worldly perspective, Nebuchadnezzar was absolutely at the top of his game here. You figure the chapter before, he had enough gold to erect a giant statue made out of gold. Right now, if you came and put a gun to my head and say, hey, Tim, you're losing a tooth. You have to come up with enough gold to replace your tooth. I would have a struggle with it. And he made, had enough laying in storage to make a giant statue to himself. He has just taken over Egypt and Israel, two of the biggest powers that be at the time. He has rolled over top of them and absorbed them. And his kingdom, Babylon, is at the peak of its existence. He is flourishing. And then just to add insult to injury, they toss in there that he was also at rest. Because you see people who are wildly successful, but you can at least sleep at night knowing that they are absolutely miserable in their lives. You see that they're rich, they have the fancy car, they have the nice clothing, everything and anything they could possibly want they have. And the way that you don't get jealous is you look at them and go, yeah, but they're miserable. They've got it all, but what good are they? They've got the Scrooge thing going on where they've got everything they can want, but they're miserable inside. He was happy. He was at rest. This is important to point out because we cannot, we can't always line up being at rest and being successful as being right with God. And the opposite is also that is also true then, that we cannot negate, we cannot a sign that someone who is not at rest and not flourishing is out of the will of God. Keep a finger here. We're going to come back here quite often. Turn over, if you will, with me to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Last Sunday, I let you all get away without turning anywhere. I've got to fix that this week. Your fingers will get numb. Psalm 37. David is a beautiful man to write about this topic because David, as we talked about in uh, junior church today, David did not have a restful, restful, flourishing life. We talked about today how as a young man, he is sitting at the palace of Saul, sitting back what would be a very luxurious job of playing the harp for the king, if not for the fact that he was in fact... or. Uh, already anointed to replace that king, and that king did not particularly like that fact. So at that age, he's sitting there, and don't worry kids, I'm not going to do it again, but Saul's whipping javelins at his head, repeatedly. He did not have a cushy life. Psalm 37. Start reading in verse number 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who's prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off, but thou that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall, be not, shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I love this. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it's so valid for us. We just went through Christmas. A time when people get gifts. I wanted to do something this year, but I was not, you know, snow and everything, COVID. I wanted to go to Enterprise and rent the fanciest car I could get. Like the absolute peak performance, rent it for a day, just so I could park it in my driveway, put a bow on it on Christmas. Tell Rachel it's not hers, just to freak out the neighbors. Just so in the morning, the weather, 
he bought her a car. And there's like fancy Lexus sitting in the park driveway. It's easy right now to look at people and go, why are they succeeding? It's easy to look at people and go, those are just absolute vile human beings. Why do they get everything? It's easy. And the flip side's also true. It's incredibly easy to look at people who are suffering, people who are in pain, people who are suffering loss, and going, why God? It, it's been on my mind a lot this month. My parents are a beautiful example of it. My mother is the sweetest lady on the planet. And I'm not just saying that because she's my mother. Yesterday, AAA had to come to their house to jumpstart one of their batteries. She's out there offering them Christmas cookies because she feels bad they had to drive out. During the blizzard, what was it, two weeks ago? The first blizzard we had. The first one. Two weeks. I'm at work. I get a phone call from my mother saying she has shoveled half of her driveway already. My mother, who is actively fighting COVID and not able to breathe, shoveled half her driveway. I screamed. I yelled, Mother, drop the shovel right now and get inside on the couch. I go down there as quickly as I can to finish shoveling your driveway. Mom, what would you're not allowed to drive anywhere. What would possess you to shovel the driveway? She had two reasons why her driveway needed shoveled at that exact moment. First of all, there were delivery drivers possibly coming. And if the UPS driver was coming, she wanted to make sure the driveway was shoveled so that they could either A, pull in, or B, they didn't have to walk down the driveway that was unshoveled. That's good. The second reason is better. You say, Tim, it's not nice to make fun of your mother. I make fun of her about this to her face because it's a make funnable topic. She has stray cats that live in her garage. They are her support cats. They, they rounded up at the house around the time all of her children were leaving the nest. Therefore, they became the absorber of all that random affection that she could no longer splurge on us. They all weigh about 900 pounds. None of them's feet have actually touched the ground in years. They live in her garage. If she, I wish I was joking, but I'm standing behind the pulpit. I'm not allowed to lie. If she didn't shovel the driveway, the cats would have to wade through the snow to get to the porch to eat. No cat in the history of the world has ever made it through snow to find food. Forget the fact that these cats could literally be trapped in a mine, shell for, uh, mine shaft for months and survive off the fat of the land. Forget that. If they could not have a clear path to her, her porch, they would starve to death within the hour. My mother is as wholesome as they come. She does not have a wicked word to say about anybody. She is sweet. Well, she's going to after she sees this. There will be one after tonight. Sweet, innocent, my dad falls along the same. My dad doesn't scream. My dad doesn't yell. My dad doesn't get in fights or debates. He's very calm. They are good people who both have had an absolute terrible month. Both times my dad has been released from the hospital, it's been in a blizzard. Both times. They have been to the hospital three separate times. They have got, I've gone to the Elwood City Giant Eagle more times than I can count to pick up medication for them. It's a nightmare. And it's easy for us to sit there as Christians and go, explain to me, while vile human beings are living in the lap of luxury, while people like that are suffering. Nebuchadnezzar, at the point in the chapter we read, is a miserable human being who is very content to toss people into a fiery furnace for not bowing down to worship him. He's not a nice guy. But yet he is resting and he is flourishing. But David tells us in Psalm 37, don't let that bug you. Fret not yourself. Don't let it get your goat up. Don't waste a moment of your energy on it. I love the alternatives that he gives us there in Psalm 37. He says, don't worry about, don't fret, fret not over them. They're going to fade away soon. Instead of that, trust in the Lord and do good. 
simple concepts. You trust that whatever's happening, the good, the bad, the fun, the exciting, the miserable, the nightmares, all of it is him. Trust in him and do good. That's the part we lose. We get so hung up on how we have been shortchanged and how we have been robbed and how our life is not fair that we lose the good. We get such in our own little stupor going, well, it's not fair. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, I drove around from work to seven different restaurants delivering homemade Christmas cookies. They were the good ones. They were the ones that didn't congeal into the one giant cookie. They were the ones that made it. They passed the test. For those of you who haven't picked up on this, earlier in the week I decided, it's a yearly tradition, I bake all my store managers the greatest chocolate chip cookie ever. It's supposed to be the greatest chocolate chip cookie. The recipe is a great chocolate chip cookie recipe. It's like 95% butter and the other 5% is chocolate. It is beautiful. It's a good cookie. I go to start baking them. I have to bake like 100 and some odd chocolate chip cookies. I'm not a baker. I'm not. I can do a cannoli in a pinch and that's about it. I get all my stuff. I buy like six, I buy literally like eight boxes of butter. I buy all the chocolate chunks. I'm sitting in my kitchen. I've got it all spread out. Like I feel like I'm on a cooking show. I've got all my little jars of measurements. I'm like, this is great. This is awesome. I get my first, for my first batch of cookies, I get my first six sticks of butter into there to whip them up. I get my hand mixer. This has been our hand mixer since we've been married for 12 years. This hand mixer has been steady eddy in our lives. I flip it on. I put it in. I smell smoke. I have two days before Christmas to run around and try to find a hand mixer while my butter is melting on the counter. I did not, these, if one of my managers had not come to me, she may be watching tonight. She has a tendency to watch my preaching. If you're watching Blair, you are the reason they got cookies. Because she told me two weeks ago, if she did not get Christmas cookies on Christmas Eve, she was quitting. Because at 9 o'clock at night, when I get to produce a valid cookie, I was going, that's it, everyone's getting a tie. I don't care anymore. I'm buying each other. Christmas Eve, I'm driving around delivering these. It is pouring rain. I'm in downtown Pittsburgh stuck in traffic. I am miserable. And it's easy to go, God, this ain't fair. Trust in the Lord and do good. And then follow down the list. The light that yourself also in Him and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, cease from anger and forsake wrath, verse 8. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I've preached on meek before. It's a great word. It's a beautiful trait us Christians have kind of warped. Meekness doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean puny. It doesn't mean unwilling or unable to stand up for yourself. The word for meek is the same word they would use to describe a horse that had been broken. It still had all its power, it still had all its force, it still had every bit of strength it had, but it's under control of someone else. Whenever we as Christians become meek, meaning we die to self as it were, and we put everything we have in the hands of an almighty God and say, God, I'm going to trust you, no matter what's happening, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to fret over the evildoers. I'm not going to do evil. I trust you. Whatever you want, God, you get the final words there in verse 11. You get that abundance of peace. Meaning you can sit there and watch Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked, vile man who just tried to burn your best friends. You could watch him at rest and flourishing in his palace. It doesn't faze you because you are at peace. You've put your trust in an almighty God and you're going to let him control your life. And he's going to give you peace. He's going to give you the desires of your heart. Life will be okay. Two weeks ago, if you had asked my parents, 
do you enjoy COVID? They would have said no. It was not a fun time. They did not have a riot with it. It was not fun. But because of that, because my dad went to the hospital, because he was struggling, because of that, they were able to find what was wrong with his heart. If they, if he, if they had never ended up in the hospital, if there's two people on this planet who had no right getting COVID, it's my mom and dad. My mom treated it like there was a plague last year this time when there was nothing wrong. The world went frantically searching for sanitary wipes. My, wife, my mom already had like the drum of them in her basement. You think I go crazy for the COVID stuff. You should see my mother. She has hazmat suits. It's wonderful. There's no earthly sense why they should have it. But if they hadn't have had it, they wouldn't have found what was wrong with my dad's heart. We don't know, we don't see the big picture. I'm not even going to say at the end of it all, we'll see the big picture. We may not till we get to heaven. We may never know the little inconsistencies, the variance of passes, that time that car took two cranks to start up instead of one. And what had happened? We trust in him. We are meek. We put all of our control in him. We're not angry. We delight ourselves. We trust in the Lord. And we live in peace. But Nebuchadnezzar had it going pretty well. Real quick, before we turn back, this is only appropriate because of the timing. Je Jeremiah 12. Jeremiah 12 on your way back to Daniel. Jeremiah 12 was written around the time whenever the Babylonian captivity is starting. So this is happening around the same time as what we're reading in Daniel. Jeremiah 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, let it, yet let me talk with thee, thy judgments. Wherefore does the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are they happy that uh, deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root. They grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart towards thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. I love Jeremiah's description of it here because he's echoing a lot of the thoughts of David. Why are they prospering? He, he gives the analogy of like trees. They are planted, they have firm foundations, they're even bringing forth fruit, Lord. Why? And his rationale is, you know me though. You know me. Take care of them, deal with them, because you know we're, I'm asking you to put your trust in Him. Trust that he, is no, he knows what He's doing. Trust His will. Trust His timing. Even when it doesn't make sense, don't get angry. Don't be rage-filled. Do good. Trust in Him. The way I can say that and be justified is He knows us. He knows what is best for us. It's not like we are indebted to an partial, impersonal God who is just kind of controlling things from a distance and we are tr to trust in Him. We're trusting in a God that knows us, who cares for us. He knows the exact level of stress my mother can handle before she snaps. She knows the, he knows the exact level that the cats need to be taken care of. He understands all that. So we know whatever we're put through, whatever comes our way, whether it be good, bad, ugly, we know that it is custom made by a God who knows us. Flip back over to Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Even though he was resting, even though he was flourishing, in the dead of night, at the darkest times, fear came. It had to be a very, very intense dream. When was the last time any of y'all have been scared by a dream? I have a weird thing. It's, 
It terrifies Rachel to death. Occasionally, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally, right when I'm at the cusp of sleep, my mind will go, this, is, this, is, this looks like time for some fun, crack. Hey, Tim, I'm sleeping, leave me alone. There's a spider on you. No, there isn't. Yeah, there is. I don't believe you. Well, too bad. I'm going to make it pretend like you do. And I will fling myself out of bed. It's particularly fun because I am a burrower in bed. Like, I have the 90-pound weighted blanket and six blankets on top of that. We were joking around Christmas time. Rachel asked me, Tim, if I buy you more blankets, are you just going to toss them on the bed? I went, absolutely. You can never have too many blankets on your bed. I want it to be to where if my house catches fire and I sleep through it because I'm obviously going to sleep through it. I sleep through everything. The blankets will insulate me. The house can burn to the ground and I will still be fine. Like six levels of blankets will be burnt. I'll just be stuck underneath there. I'll be like a baked potato. It will be wonderful. And all of those will go flying off because I'm convinced there's a spider. My mind will have convinced me there's a spider in the bed and it wants to kill you. It has a knife. It is ready for you to die. And I'm out of bed. Terrifies her to death. It never happens when she's at work. I don't get it. I'll be home alone in bed. I could jump out of the bed and no one would notice. The dog would sit there and be looking at me so strange. But that's okay. It doesn't like me anyhow. It only happens when she's in bed. But the last time I've had a legitimate dream where I woke up and went, man, that dream freaked me out. It doesn't happen. But here's the ruler of what would be the free world at the time, terrified by a dream. I wish I could say this is just because of him being wicked. I wish I can tell you that this was a direct response to Nebuchadnezzar being sinful. This particular circumstance is, but the sad fact of the matter is every single person in this room at some point or another is going to have fear put into their lives. It's winter. You may hit a patch of ice on the way home and you have fear immediately put into your life. Keep a finger here. Turn with me, if you will, back to Psalm 56. Psalm 56. Going back to our buddy David. Just like he's a man who would be sitting there watching Saul prosper and flourish when he's getting javelins tossed at his head. David is a man who legitimately had fears. He had one of the most powerful men in the world at the time, desperate to see him dead. Psalm 56, start reading in verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, for men would swallow me up. He fighteth daily, he, he fighting daily oppresseth me. My enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me. O thou most high, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. Every day they verse my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my step when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? And thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings put through my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word, and the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. The vows are upon me, O God. I render praise unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? This passage, we see a couple themes kind of come to the surface. David's afraid. He has good reason to be afraid. There are men who would desire nothing more than to kill and swallow him up. And the Bible says there, when I cry unto thee, he gets afraid. David doesn't live a life to where we like to paint David, uh, we like to paint any people in the Bible as superheroes. They are superhuman. David taking the sling and stone and bringing down the Goliath. He, he's a superhero. David's 
cried unto the Lord. David was so afraid, he screamed unto God for help. He was afraid. The difference is, and this is where it varies from being Nebuchadnezzar to being David. We're going to find out when Nebuchadnezzar is afraid, he takes action. He's going to call all his wise men to him. He's going to call all his soothsayers and all the people who can see the future. He's going to try to fix the problem. Something's wrong. I need to fix it. David, whenever fear came into his life, he had a couple steps he did. One, he trusted in the Word of God. How many times down through that chapter we read, does it mention, I will trust thy word? Verse 4, in God I will praise his word. I have put my, I, in God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh shall do unto me. Every day they worship my words. All the thoughts are evil. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, verse number 10, in God will I praise his word. In the Lord I have praised his word. He focuses, first of all, on the word of God. I'm a fixer. It's my natural response to any problem. You can come to me and say, hey, Tim, my tire just fell off my car and rolled down 37th Street. My response would be, okay, what can I do to fix that? Let me go chase down the tire. Let me go get it. Let me fix it. My, dad, my mom says, hey, Tim, I need to shovel the driveway. The cats can't get to the door. Okay, let me come down there. I'll shovel your driveway. Christmas Day, it snowed again. We opened up the presents. The kiddo had the stuffed animals everywhere. I said, okay, let's get I call my brother, let's get in the car, let's go shovel my mom's driveway, you know the cats need bed. We jumped on it before it even became an option because I'm a fixer. Sometimes the only solution to our fear is to praise and trust in his word. You're afraid, dig into his word. Listen to what he has to say to you. Remember, we're serving a God who knows us. We talked about in Sunday school, we're serving a God who loves us and treasures us and values us. Trust his word. And you'll notice the very specific wording there. He's praising it. It's hard to praise when you're afraid. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say it's easy. We're going to have New Year's Eve coming up, a time that's traditionally dedicated a lot to praising the Lord for all the things that happened. Unless we really try hard, it's going to be a very short list this year for 2020. Unless some of you all got like stock and disinfectant wipes in February, at which point you should come see me after church. It's hard to praise the Lord when you're afraid. That's not our natural response. None of you driving home today, if you hit that black ice and your car starts twirling, is going to be sitting there going, glory to his name. You're not going to do it. That's not the first words out of your mouth. I don't want to hear what the first words out of your mouth are That's between you and God. We praise his name. Nebuchadnezzar is going to go into fix mode. He's going to go and, okay, everything has fallen apart around me. I am afraid. What can I do to fix it? It's his MO. We've seen it so far for the entirety of Daniel. Daniel tells him the dream, how his kingdom is glorious, the head of gold, but it's going to come to an end and the next kingdom is going to come take over. His response, well, then I'll just make a statue of solid gold so my kingdom never ends. He has a dream he can't remember. He calls people and he starts killing them off until they can tell him what he dreamt. He goes into how can I control the situation, which is Fine, but it's not going to take care of the fear. How do we get that peace we talked about early? It's by making ourselves meek. How do we become meek? We put all of our power, all of our control into the hands of an almighty God. That becomes important when the more competent you are. If something breaks in my house, let's say I go home Rachel says something smelt weird in the basement and now the power doesn't work. I may be afraid, but I'm not going to be able to fix the problem. I'm going to have to call someone 
and I'm going to call Arena and say, hey, Arena, something went in my basement. Can you come fix it? She's saying, okay, whatever. Come down and fix my uh, circuit breaker in the basement at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because I have no control over that. I can't fix that. What can I fix? If there's a fried chicken emergency, not a cookie emergency, if there's something, to, if a fryer goes bad at one of my stores, my people panic. Hey, Tim, the fryer's on fire. What do I do? I can fix that. I know that one. Pick me. I've burnt many a fryer to the ground. I know how to handle this one. That's when it's harder to give your control up to someone else. To have that meekness to say, God, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to just instantly go into fix mode. You're in charge. What's up? He was resting and peaceful even though he was wicked. He was afraid. Back to Daniel, chapter 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and visions of my head had, tr had troubled me. Real quick side note before we continue on. That's how it's going to be just for all of you all, so you can prepare yourselves. Right now, none of you are going to get horrifically afraid because you have your brothers and sisters around you. If something goes wrong, you can turn around and say, Pastor, what do we do? It's going to happen when you're laying in bed in the middle of the night. That's when the fear comes. We can piece it together real well throughout the day. We've gotten very good at putting on a face, hiding all of our insecurities and problems. I walk into a KFC and no one has any idea anything is wrong with my life. Christmas Eve, if you ask all the managers I saw, not a single one of them would tell you that Tim Winkle was annoyed about life. Nobody. I was a bubbly ball of energy. I was happy. And we can put on that mask that covers our shame and fear and terror, but when you're laying in bed in the middle of the night, that's when the fear is going to come. That's when it's going to sneak into your life. That's when Satan takes the opportunity of, hey, you think you're going to sleep. Let me tell you why you're not. Don't let it get to you. Praise his word. Spend time in it. Absorb it. Meditate on it. Make it your own so when Satan comes knocking on your door, a verse is right there to greet him. Verse number six. Therefore, because he was afraid, because something had entered his mind in the middle of the night to terrify him, therefore made I a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. I love the severity of this. He didn't just wake up and go, hey guys, bring, bring, me, bring me the wise men, I got a dream. He made it a law. He rolled out of bed. He was still in his PJs. He said, okay, bring me a scroll. I need to make a decree. He went that far trying to fix it himself. We're going to find out probably here in a month or two when we get to the end of the chapter that that's the whole point of this chapter is he could not fix it himself. But he's going to give it his best effort. Verse number seven. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them so we've got a change up of chapter 2. In chapter 2, if you remember correctly, this is a very similar story. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that freaks him out. He brings all the people before him and says, I had a dream, I want to know the interpretation of it. They go, okay, what was the dream? He says, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You're, you're, you're the soothsayers, you tell me what the dream was and you tell me what it's the dream. This time he tells them the dream. He brings anybody and everybody he can find before him and he explains the dream to them. All they have to do is give him the interpretation thereof. I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. None of them would tell what the meaning is. We're going to read the, we're going to read the dream here probably next week. Not a very particularly tough dream to interpret. It's a real softball in the whole what does this mean department. A big tree that everybody loves all of a sudden gets cut down. 
gee, I wonder what that could be, Nebuchadnezzar, who is a giant leader who everyone feeds off of. And the Bible doesn't even say that, that they could not tell him the meaning thereof. It says they would not. They refused to tell him the meaning. I believe that these men, if they had anything worth their salt, they could come up with an interpretation of the dream. If I told you last night I dreamt that a giant uncooked wad of cookie dough was rolling down a hill trying to kill me, what's that mean? If you don't tell me, I'm going to kill y'all. Y'all would have come up with what the meaning of the dream was. If your life depended on it, you would come up with a meaning. But they refused to tell him. Because when you try to do things yourselves, whenever you rely on people to help you out, people to be your solution, and people to be the one to solve your problems instead of God, they're just going to tell you what you want to hear. They're not going to tell you what's truthful. They're not going to tell you what needs said. They're going to give you the softball answer you want to hear to make you feel all warm and fuzzy. We're living in a day and age where warm and fuzzy is the name of the game. You can't insult anybody. The Three Stooges never would have flown right now. We are so desperately sensitive, and I'm not talking about going out there and being purposefully hurtful and mean and beating people up. That's not good either. But it should be okay if I come in here on Sunday morning and I go, hey, guys, does this suit and tie go? You should be able to say, no, Tim, it looks hideous. After church, you all should be able to say, Tim, I loved your preaching. Your singing is still terrible, though, just in case you're wondering. Oh, people are too nice. They won't do that. Flip over, if you will, to 2 Timothy. Gesundheit. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's giving his kind of last hurrah to a young preacher, Timothy. We'll find out at the end of the chapter, he's, he's done, he's ready to go, he has given everything there is to give. In chapter 4, he's giving him a warning. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables if I may paraphrase. People are going to like preachers and speakers and people who get up and tell them things that make them feel warm and fuzzy. That may even be people who preach on sins. Because I could preach on sins that are very easy for you all to fix. I could get up here, I could... It was a great illustration I saw once in college. They were talking about altar calls and the importance of them, but the dangers of them. You can fill an altar very easily. I could get up here and I could preach and hoot and holler, get you all emotionally involved, have an altar call, you're all down here crying, sobbing, you know, dripping COVID tears all over the platform, and go back to your seat, go home feeling warm and fuzzy because you are better. But that's not... Bible's about. It's okay to read the Bible and walk away feeling bad. It's okay to walk away feeling guilty. It's okay to walk away knowing you're not good enough. That's the point. You'll notice that it doesn't say, the passage doesn't say, you know, they're gonna they're gonna heap to themselves teachers having itching ears who are gonna turn away from the truth and be turned on the fables. Therefore, get up there and step on every toe you can. That's not what he wants. There's a fine line down the middle, and Paul tells Timothy right there what to do. He says, in fact, let me not paraphrase it, because I don't want to mess it up. Preach the word, 
be instant in season and out of season, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering in doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned on the fables. Paul said, be careful of people who just want to hear warm fuzzies. Your response? Preach this. This is why I very rarely preach a point where I don't have you turn a couple other places. Because I don't want to get up here. I'm, t I'm human. This is going to come as a shocker to you. I own soap boxes. Literal soap boxes. We've got treats in them for the kiddo. They gave them away because there's no school lunches. We've got 6,000 teeny tiny pints of chocolate milk in our fridge. It's phenomenal. There's nothing like waking up at 2 a.m., stumbling to your fridge in a daze and grabbing a pint of chocolate milk. It's phenomenal. It's the best thing that's ever happened. I have soap boxes. I could get up here and preach on all my little... If you haven't been able to tell listening to my junior churches, I take some bizarre, completely unnecessary, completely earth-moving stances like the color of watermelon candy. And I will take a stance on it, this will be my hill, and I will gladly die thereon. Watermelon candy should be red, not green. If it has a shell, the shell can be green, but the candy itself needs to be red. And I can do that. I can passionately get you guys furled up about any number of things, but it has to be doctrine. Ephesians 4 tells us a beautiful thing, telling the truth in love. We preach the truth. We preach the Bible. We preach what God would want us to preach, the things he's preached against, the sins that are preached, the rules that are preached, the doctrines that the Lord gives us. We preach that. But we don't use it as a hammer to beat you all over the head. As a preacher, my job is not to make you feel guilty. My job is to show you the Bible. My job is not to convict any one of you of a sin. And my job is to show you the Bible. Any religion that founds itself upon causing their parishioners to feel guilty all the time is not a religion of God. We are to preach the truth. If God has something he wants to convict in your all's heart and life, that's between you and God. Our job is to preach it, but preach it in love. Turn real quick before we continue on. Ephesians 4, a good passage. I was going to avoid it, but... We've got all the time in the world. Christopher, we're, we're going to exactly the maturity level of your youth pastor. Uh, we've got a game of exploding kittens to finish downstairs. Christopher just revealed my streaking kitten, and that just can't be tolerated. So we, we've got to just deal with that down in the basement. So we've got all the time in the world. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, by the cunning of craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him and in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supply of according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Paul is very passionate about it. We don't get carried around with every whim of doctrine, every new doctrine that comes along. I have got six secrets from the Bible that will change your life. No, you don't. We don't get carried across with every whim of doctrine. We preach the truth, but the whole theme of the passage is the tr speaking the truth is for the effort of unifying the body. Fitly joining us together, being one. 
Just like I talked about at the end of Sunday school, the whole purpose of the church is that we be unified. We present a front of Christ. You know how churches are divided? Very, 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 very few churches divide, like good churches, divide on interpretation of the Bible. It'll happen from time to time, but that's not the main thing that gets it. The main thing that drives churches apart is when extracurricular stuff gets tossed on board. Whenever I, as the preacher, have my own stance, and I am going to I get the mic on Sunday night. From Sunday night, I don't care who you are. I don't care what stance you have. Watermelon candy is red. If you don't like it, there's the doors. I even shoveled the... Get out of here. If you're a green watermelon person, you deserve to get out of there. Go to the Presbyterians. They're green watermelon people. Heathens. I can get up here and beat you all up, but that's not going to unify the body. And when I get up and decide I want to talk and I want to preach on things that matter to Tim Winkle, and let me tell you six reasons why Tim Winkle thinks watermelon candy should be red, that's a recipe for <laughs> splitting the body when we need more than ever to be unified. This is how the world's going to come crashing to a halt, is we're all going to be so ripped apart and fighting that we can't unify for anything. The church should be the last place that happens. We focus on the Word of God, we focus on what He has, and even if it hurts feelings, even if it doesn't make us feel warm and fuzzy, it's okay. It's okay if pastor steps on your toes, because guess what? Pastor steps on his own toes every so often. If I say something that offends you, don't feel bad. Every sermon I preach, I preach to myself before it ever makes it to you. And I am a lot harder on me than I am on you guys. You all can beat me up. I can't beat me up. I can say whatever I want to me. Back to Daniel. He was resting peacefully even though he was wicked. He was afraid in the middle of the night. The people told him what he wanted to hear. Verse 7 again. Then came the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last... Daniel came in before me. At the last, Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is going to learn his lesson here. I'm going to spoil the end of the chapter for those of you who don't know. I believe he gets saved. I believe it because the Bible seems to give evidence that he gets saved. You say, Tim, but prior chapters you've seen that he has made a quote-unquote salvation testimony, what makes this time different? One, God uses them to write a portion of the Bible. Two, history even tells us that at the end of his life, around when this time this chapter is written, the world views him as having kind of gone insane. His entire demeanor, everything he stood for, everything he standed for changed on a dime. I think he got saved. I could be wrong. I'm not willing to say, this ain't watermelon candy I'm talking about. I'm willing to be flexible on this one. But it took to the last for Daniel. I don't believe that's by accident. By, chap by this point, by chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar knows where Daniel stands. He's seen Daniel's stance with what he ate. He saw Daniel's stance with the statue. He has no problem giving bad news. I truly and honestly feel that Nebuchadnezzar woke up in the middle of the night terrified of what his dream meant, and he wanted to bring people who was going to soothe him back to sleep. But at the last, Daniel. How is this important to us? Because we may not be at the last yet. There may be people in your lives who need Christ, who you have tried to be a witness to, you've tried to share the gospel to, You've tried with all of your might. You've prayed for them until tears stream down your face. And you've done everything in your power to be the witness that God wants you to be. And it hasn't happened. It may not be the last yet. Turn with me, if you will. Acts 27. Acts 27. 
Acts 27. I'm running out of bookmarks, so we're almost done. Acts 27. Acts 27 is a great story in the New Testament. It is Paul sailing to Rome. And for those of you who know the story, the story does not go particularly fondly for, Rome, uh, for Paul. He gets on the ship. They sail to an island. He says, guys, we should kind of hang out here for the winter. Things are going to get bad. Everyone goes, nah, we're good. And they continue on their merry way. And a bunch of grown fishermen are tossed into a storm. So, or grown sailors, they weren't fishermen. A bunch of grown sailors get tossed into a storm so bad that it, they're fearing for their lives. The ship is being torn apart. They have to toss stuff out. The crew is getting ready to dive overboard and lead the prisoners to their own demise. Verse number 20. Oh, let's go to verse number 19. Verse number 19, Acts 27. And the third day we cast out of our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many day appear, no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. That's a scary phrase, that all hope was taken away. They had hit rock bottom. And what I think one of the most beautifully sarcastic passages, Paul steps up, verse 21, but after long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them, the great apostle Paul, great orator who wrote so many beautiful passages of the Bible, whose doctrines and verses are still used today to affect the lives of millions, Paul stands up and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete to be gained this harm and loss. Gentlemen, I hate to say I told you so, but the shoe kind of fits. This is important because while people may be responding that way to you, some of us have been in that spot. We have run from God, we have turned our back on Him, we have gone so far out of the will of God, we can't even remember what the will of God was like, we've turned to everything we can possibly do to bring back that hope. And we finally get to the point where we turn around, God's standing there going, I told you this was going to be a bad idea. And God has every... Paul's going to be taken care of. God makes that abundantly clear for the end of this chapter, that even a snake latching onto his arm is not going to be enough to face him. And God has every right to say, listen guys, you ignored the man of God, you've ignored my message, you have turned your back on me, now you suffer the consequences. Verse 22, and now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall not be any loss of any man's life among you but the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, for there must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given these all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall not that shall be even as it was told me. I am so glad that in my life looking back, when I have tried to sail away from God, when I've run as far as I can, when I've turned my back on Him, when I said, God, it's over. When I got to the last and brought forth Daniel, when I finally turned my back and looked at God, when I said, God, I'm in trouble here, I'm sinking fast. There's still a loving God there beside me who goes, okay, welcome back. There's going to be punishment. You're going to lose the ship. You're going to be tossed upon an island. There's still punishment, but you know what? It's going to be okay. You're fine. Come here. It's okay. I still love you. I remember growing up. I ran away from home once. Just once. I lived out in the middle of the country. It was a mile to the nearest sign of life, and that was a Sheets. And for Christopher, for you kids who you know, you know Sheets now, where you can like you know go in and get a full turkey roasted for you, that wasn't the Sheets of my day. They had like three subs, and that was it. Like this was not like you, know, you couldn't live there. I ran away once. I remember it vividly. I wrote my note. It was spelled terribly because I still can't spell. 
My mom was sleeping on the couch. I left it on the floor by the couch. I gathered up the belongings that were important to me, which amounted to my Game Boy, and I head, head out to hit the open road. I made it not a tenth of the mile from my house. And I realized, you know what? Running away is fun, but you know what's hard? Walking. Yeah, I think I'll go back. I think I'll go back. I'm glad when I did, my mom didn't hold me to my note. I'm glad when I walked back in the door, my mom was like, Tim, I thought you ran away. I changed my mind. I'm glad she didn't say, well, Tim, I'm sorry, you said you were running away. We kind of, we rented out your room already. That happened when I was in college. I'm glad she took me back with open arms. I'm glad the story of the prodigal son doesn't end with the prodigal son coming back and being a servant to his father. I'm glad whenever the Apostle Paul was on a ship in the middle of nowhere sinking badly, God didn't say, okay, Paul, you're safe because you're mine. Everyone else has to pay the ultimate price. And I'm glad whenever Tim Winkle has turned his back on what God wanted him to do, God doesn't just turn his back on me. I'm glad there comes a chance whenever Daniel can come forward and still give the answer. Through the anger, through the fear, through the doubt, through the people just sitting there patting you on the back, saying, no, 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 it's okay, it's all going to be fine. There's still a chance for Daniel to show up. And lastly, back in Daniel chapter 4. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, before I told the dream, saying. Fascinating description of Daniel. He says, it's Daniel, but his name really is Belteshazzar because of the God whom I serve. So before his repentance came, before God the Father was able to show forth his power, Nebuchadnezzar was still stuck on his gods, where his power came from. Even to the point where he acknowledges Daniel's God, but he has morphed it to be fitting for what he believes. You'll notice there, I said, in whom the spirits of the holy gods, the gods of Israel, the gods who had power, the gods who interpreted the dream before, and save the three children in the fiery furnace, those gods. He trusted in Daniel because he was convinced that Daniel had power by other means than the holy God. Just a side note before we launch into this story, you say, Tim, how do I know that Nebuchadnezzar got saved? You'll notice there in verse 8 we just read, it's the holy God's lowercase g, correct? Jump back up to verse number one. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all the people, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be unto you, uh, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to share the signs and wonders that the high God hath brought towards me. Whenever he's in trouble, when he finally turns to Daniel, it's his the power he thinks he can conjure up power in his fake gods, the power in the fake version of Daniel's God he's made. But at the end, he gets to see what real power is. Because this is where everything comes down to a head. The trust we put in God, the faith we put in God, the praise we put in His Word, the trusting in His doctrines, even if it hurts us, the fact that we turn to Him at the last, all that is dependent on who we're turning to. Where are we looking for the power to come from? And this is where a lot of Christians have fallen short. Because not everyone, as the Bible says, who professes the name of God is His. Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, shall be ushered into the kingdom of heaven. I can take the Bible and I can paint the picture of God to be exactly how I picture my God. Or... I can take the Bible and I can paint a picture of God that is most profitable for me to paint the picture of God. 
and I can take God, the God of the Bible, the doctrines of the Bible, the very passages of the Bible, and I can skillfully weave them to mean whatever I want. Nebuchadnezzar knew that there was a power behind Daniel. He just wanted to morph it into his own way. He wanted to take that power and say, that's fun, let me fix that. Let me take that and tweak it and change it so something I can control, something I have power over, something that I have. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalms chapter 20. Psalms chapter 20, last place I'll have you turn. Also, side, it's good to note here while you're turning to Psalms 20. You say, well, Tim, Nebuchadnezzar was saved at that point because he believed that Daniel served a high God. Yes, he didn't fully understand it. He didn't fully accept, but he believed in him. Isn't that enough? James tells us the demons believe. Just because you go to church, just because you quote-unquote say, I believe there's a God, doesn't mean you're saved. Psalm 20. We started off, and I just unplugged my light. That's okay. I'm under spotlights. I'll be able to read. Psalm 20, going back to our man David. Lord, hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt offering, Selah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfilled all thy petitions. Now know that I, now know I that the Lord saveth, saveth his anointed, and he will hear him from the holy heavens with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the King hear us when we call. I love that specifically the thing that David clings to, the thing that David looks for his power and his deliverance from, is not the God that he has constructed in his brain. Not his picture of what God is. Not what is socially acceptable for him to have as his God. It is in the very name of God. Scroll back down through that passage. Look at every time David calls out to the name of the Lord. To the name of God. Even that famous verse. verse some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots. Verse number uh, 7. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We talked about in Sunday school, that just doesn't know, mean that he's, you know, I'm trusting in the name of God, God. I'm trusting in the name of the Lord, Jehovah. That name represents the very character and being of God. I'm a winkle. Anyone who knows my father before me or knows my brothers, it is painfully obvious that I'm a winkle. There are certain traits that are very winkle. The weird obsession with watermelon candy is one of them. My dad's favorite candy was a watermelon Jolly Rancher. I remember that. I believe they were red, if memory serves. My name represents a lot about my character. That's why I've preached before to our teenagers, you have a name. Your name should stand for something. Your name should mean something. When people say your name, it should have an association with it of someone who serves God and stands for God. When David was looking for power, when David was looking for deliverance, when David was looking for someone to come along and help him, he didn't look to Belshazzar, my gods, or the holy gods, the gods that I have constructed out of Daniel's doctrine to serve me. He turned to the very character of God. That's important and plays into everything we've talked about because whenever you truly, I talked about you know, praising his word, trusting in his word, turning to his word whenever you're afraid. When you do that, you have to do so in a manner 
to where you accept the full Word of God. That means you'll accept whenever the Bible tells you something that you think to be wrong. You know how many great sermons I had when I was a teenager and in college and growing up? Some wonderful sermons. The points lined all up. They were Back in college, I used to alliterate everything. You know, I thought that was meant to be a pastor. You had to alliterate, you had to have a little poem, you had to do special. That I've had to toss out because God showed me in the Bible that I was completely off base. Whenever we turn to the very character of God and we say, God, show me your name. It means we're accepting that sometimes it may not be what we expect. It may not be everything that we're hoping for. It may not be everything that we've planned on being. If this year has taught you anything, it should have taught you that nothing goes how we plan. Nothing at all. We have a New Year's Eve watch night service planned for Thursday. It's a 50-50 shot whether we all get together. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. We're planning on it. It's the goal. All of y'all should go out and buy a can of vegetables, but is it going to happen? Your guess is as good as ours at this point. You know how many times I've put our lobby is now open and our lobby is now closed signs up? I'm getting good at it. I'm getting practice. 14.2 seconds to close down a lobby. It's good. We have no control over everything, and that includes the name of God. Sometimes what we need to hear from God is the last possible thing we expect. When I was in college, my senior year, I remember it so vividly. I enjoyed preaching. I thought it was fun. I thought it was neat. For senior year for our ministerial class, once we had to go out into the wild and preach at a local church. It couldn't be our local church we normally knew because they knew you. They liked you. They would not toss tomatoes at you. You had to pick a church you had never been for, to before to preach. I picked a church with my best friend in downtown Mobile, Alabama. Downtown Mobile, Alabama. Have you ever been to downtown Mobile, Alabama? You don't want to be there past dark. You don't want to be there with your car unlocked. And we went and we planned, we had it in our brain. We were young, we were stupid, we were college kids. We had the world before us. We had a literary sermon, so it was wonderful. We planned exactly how the night was going to go. We were going to drive into this church. The preacher who we had signed on to preach for was a very well-known preacher. He'd come and preached our chapel a couple times. He was a great man of God. It was going to be a huge church service. We would be in front of the crowd. It would be, God would move. People would flood the altar. First time we went out there, we were in a very, 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 very bad-looking housing development. Looking at our address going, I don't think this is a church. That young lady over there does not look like she's ready to take up the offering. This doesn't look like where God wants me to preach. And we circled Mobile, Alabama for hours not finding the church, okay? God, you have a plan. All things are in your according to your will. Obviously, this is your will. No, we were just stupid and got the wrong address. That's okay. Next time, next time, building we're going to walk into, it's going to be packed full of people. It's going to be great. We pull up the church. We go, okay, it's a little smaller than we planned, but oh well. They'll pack it in there. You know what? Smaller churches are better because if you have a smaller building, less people fill it. It makes it look better. You know, standing room only. I preach to a standing room only crowd. Grant the size is you know the size of our nursery, but whatever, it's standing room only. We walk in. The pastor's there, real nice fellow, friendly, comes over. Hey guys, how's it going? We're so happy you came out. We're so excited to hear what God has for us tonight. We're excited to hear. Awesome, awesome, awesome. How's it going? This is my friend such and so. He, I brought him in tonight. He's excited to be here too. Awesome, awesome, awesome. How many people are you expecting here tonight? Well, you guys came, right? Yeah. Okay. I think we're about all here. Then we're ready to get started. I'm preaching to a crowd of Surrey, 
one of which is my best friend. I already know all the sins he's committing, and there's nothing I can do about he's another nerf. Nothing I can do about that. One's a preacher who, in every sense of the word, outranks me. And the other is the preacher, preacher's best friend. God, this isn't couldn't possibly be what you want from me. This isn't the this isn't what you had planned. They told me, ministerial student, we are going to go out there and change the world. How am I supposed to change the world with a preacher, his best friend, and my bum of a front best friend? This can't be what you have planned. But I'll tell you this. I can tell you exactly what I preached that night. I can't tell you if it changed any of their lives. It affected me. It shaped that sermon that I may have just preached to myself and that was it. It has made an impactful impact on my life. Because when you trust in the name of God, when you say, God, all my predispositions of what you are, what you believe, what your doctrine says, all of it goes out the window. Show me from your word. Show me what is true. Let me trust in your word. Show me your name. Show me your character. Whatever it is, I believe in it. I will take your word at face value. You never know what God's going to show you. You never know what aspects of your spirituality are going to go out the window. We did David and Goliath two weeks ago. Growing up, David and Goliath. Great story. David gets up there, and they always demonstrate it the same. They bring the big guy in. I remember in uh, Mount Salem, it was Sean Maroney standing on coffee makers. I can remember that vividly to make him look tall. And they always do the same thing. They get to the real scrawny kid, and they pile all the heavy clothes on him that don't fit to make him look, oh, look, he's in Saul's armor. It doesn't fit him. And that's what we believe. That's not what the Bible says, but that's what we were told and we believe. And when we take time, we say, okay, God, forget about what I've taught, been taught my entire life. What does your word say? We see that he didn't wear the armor because he hadn't proved it. And it goes from a story of us not being able to wield the word of God because it's too big for us. It goes to a story to where David wasn't able to use it because it was not something he was familiar with and dangerous of taking scripture that you haven't taken time to study and to pray over and wielding it as a weapon. Take the name of the Lord. Because I can tell you, you're going to see days where life is miserable and you don't know why. The world is succeeding, the w wicked are successful. Christopher, even though he's a stinking cheater, exploding kittens, is going to win the game. And it doesn't make sense, it's not fair, but it's okay. You trust in the Lord, you praise the word of the Lord, and he's going to guide you. You're going to have fear in the middle of the night. No matter how well composed and put together you may seem, in the dead of night, Satan's going to whisper in your ears, guess what, you're not good enough. And despite everything you know, you're going to believe him. You're going to turn to friends, and your friends are just going to tell you what they want you, you want to hear. And it may take to the very end before you turn to God and say, okay, God, I'm ready. Show me your power. But when that time comes, be ready to see the very name of God. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and no one looking around tonight. We have made it to the end of 2020. This is my last Sunday night sermon of 2020. You have survived. You'll pick up your t-shirts on the way out. They may or may not be on fire and made of asbestos. Seem fitting for the year. You've made it. I wish I could tell you 2021 is going to be all sunshine and unicorns. I did that for 2020. I'm going to just prepare for the worst. I'm going to prepare to feel like it's not fair. I'm going to prepare to feel like, God, all the wicked people are doing fine, and here I am serving you and suffering. I'm going to prepare to be afraid. I'm going to prepare to see things on the news, see things in the world, and go, oh boy, now what? I'm going to prepare for people just to tell me things I want to hear. I'm going to prepare for people to pat me on the back and say, oh no, it's all going to be okay. It's okay. 
I'm kind of prepared for God to maybe the last option sometimes because I am stupid. But I'm also going to prepare to see the name of the Lord. I'm going to prepare to see his word. I'm going to prepare to see the very nature of God because when we do, his power comes into our lives. He dispels the fears. He dispels the doubt. He delivers us from our hard times. And if nothing else, he knows us. You're here tonight. God spoke to your heart. I'm going to pray. The altar is going to open for you. Take it to him. Dear Mother, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day again. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege we had to come and to serve you and to worship you. I ask you to bless whatever happens here tonight. May you get the honor and glory for it. May you be lifted up. And we ask it all in your Son, Jesus' precious and holy name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking about. The altar is open for you. Take it to God. Dear Most Holy Father, Lord, we thank you for this day again. So, Lord, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege we've had to come and to worship you and to serve you. Lord, I ask you to continue to bless tonight, keep us safe on the ride home, and continue to work in our heart lives. Lord, show us your name, show us your word, show us your doctrines, Lord, show us your truths, and show us what the word of God has for us. Whatever happens, we're going to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it, and we ask it all in your Son, Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It was a blessing to have you here, even though it's cold and wet and Koppel doesn't plow their streets. At this time, we'll go ahead and stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Remember, no Wednesday evening service here. Thursday evening, 6 o'clock, bring a can of, uh, can of vegetables, your price of admittance. If you would like to preach, sing, praise, whatever God has laid upon your heart, reach out to the pastor. He'll toss you on the schedule. Um, if you want to see a very vicious game of exploding kittens, Roundup will be in the basement. Christopher may be a dirty cheater. So let's go ahead and stand. We'll dismiss in a word of prayer. Pastor, why don't you go ahead and pray us out?